Welcome back. Uh, this is Miss Check, and of course, uh, we've been discussing issues around um, uh, infrastructure development. Time now to switch gears and discuss extractive industries. In case you didn't know, Kenya is targeting to reap about 10% uh, of uh, economic growth from uh, the extractive industry, and that's why there is a lot of activities in revamping the regulatory environment to try and bring it up to speed there's also a lot of research being done to try and understand what lies beneath us we know there's oil there's gold there's um there's titanium there's coal uh, but what are we doing to tap into all these resources for uh, economic development stephen wakesi is a public is a public policy analyst he's also a uh, 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 an extractive industry uh, expert. He's joining us this morning, of course, to help us uh, make sense of all these issues. Thank you so very much indeed, uh, 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 Stephen Mwakesi. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I want you, first of all, to paint to us uh, the picture of the extractive industry in this country. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the extractive industry in, uh, in Kenya is one that's been there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the oldest uh, forms of uh, economic uh, uh, activity that we have uh, uh, and it dates back to pre-colonial period and that uh, actually shows from the fact that uh, the mining law that was in place mm -hmm. uh, for the longest time was actually enacted in 1940 just right 20 years before we even gained independence yeah so uh for the extractive sector it has been uh, something that's been ongoing for a while we were mining uh, uh, a lot of uh, materials from soda ash to gold uh, to we had quite a thriving yes uh, industry also in that might uh, so so these activities had been going on for quite a while uh, and only when uh, the in 2013 when president Uru Kenyatta came in uh, he found it quite prudent to to try and uh, revamp the sector by giving it a standalone ministry and so the first actions that came about from that point was to relook the licensing regime of the country yeah. see who are the players who are there people who are active or inactive uh, and and I think at that time is when uh, there was a famous uh, Balala cancellation of licenses if you, if you, if you can remember <laughs> yes, right. um, and immediately uh, before that uh, Balala had also embarked on a very uh, clear mechanism of trying to 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 re, re, uh, to to get a new act in place mm -hmm. uh, because the laws that were in use like i said were from 1940 the regime was quite old uh, so now uh, uh, he came up with a team to try and uh, uh, revamp the mining laws of the country at the time i was at the kenya chamber of mines uh, where i was the ceo and we worked together with balala uh, to try and uh, come up with a workable uh, uh, sector law and uh, God willing, we managed to do a lot of negotiations and discussions. And in 2016, Parliament enacted the Mining Act 2016, mm -hmm. which set in place a new uh, mineral regime for the country. Um, the, the first job then happened uh, at the time there was a new minister in place, uh, Dan Kazungu. He had quite a lot of work to, to try and now that uh, we had uh, revamped the, 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 the legal regime uh, to set up regulations that would actually help the new act to come into place uh, and also promote the country out there. And so uh, we embarked on a very vigorous uh, campaign internationally to try and get investors interested with the mining sector uh, because the ambition that had been set by the president at the time was to try and move the contribution of mining from a, a low of 0.8 percent to about 10 percent uh, in, in tandem with what the ambitions of vision 2030 were and so the, uh, that went on for quite a while um, there were some changes later on when cs munez came into place but one of the critical things that uh, was always on the pipeline uh, and and it, it's something that was very important for the country was that we had never done what we call an airborne geophysical survey mm -hmm. this is uh, a, a mechanism where you utilize uh, uh, planes and uh, things like that to fly over all of the country and find out what are these anomalies that uh, can create um, uh, uh, an idea 
idea for geologists about where to actually focus on and to put money and invest in. Uh, and so uh, after a long uh, back and forth, we, we tried to work with the Chinese on that. And uh, after a while, cabinet uh, decided that uh, for this activity, uh, it would be very prudent uh, if we could do it as Kenyans. And so uh, the, the, the government then embarked on having a multi-agency task force uh, led by the ministry and the Ministry of Interior. And uh, uh, a Nebun survey was started uh, late of uh, 2019 and has been ongoing and uh, the, much of the conclusive work is coming to an end by end of this month. Yeah. And we expect that once that data is released, it will be able to enable people to know what kind of mineralization are we potentially looking at uh, before we carry out uh, extensive ground survey to ensure that whatever we think are anomalies on the ground that mm -hmm. might indicate possibly there's probably gold here, there could be potentially diamonds, there could be potentially all, all manner of minerals, uh, then we we would then utilize that uh, to, to have an idea. <clears throat> now, the impact of these things has been uh, all across the globe. Uh, when you look at Ghana, uh, when you look at which is a big mining uh, jurisdiction in, 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 uh, in Africa, when you look at Uganda, countries across the Africa have been using Airborne Geophysical Survey to enable them to know and to map what are the potential areas and even now utilize that to give uh, uh, Kenyans uh, or investors globally an idea of where to actually come in. So for us, this was a very big step. It's also a big step because it was done by Kenyan expertise uh, and I think it's something that will be very exciting going forward. There are a lot of other challenges that have been there. We've been facing globally economic challenges mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and there's been very little appetite to invest in new mineral programs all across the globe uh, but whenever we, when you, you are able to demarcate or find an interesting uh, a mineral zone uh, you'll always find money globally out there so uh, for us we are just excited that uh, with the new data coming forward uh, I think the thing that the country needs to do now is to prepare for that moment when now we can be able to invite investors local and international to now be able to put some money into the sector so that we see it thrive and grow yes um the, the whole country is of course waiting for that um, uh, uh, a survey and, and mm. study that will help investors get to know mm. this is where you have diamond, mm. this is where you have gold, this is where you have oil mm. and, and so much and so I need to direct my investment in this area mm. but even as we conduct that survey these the 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 are areas that are known to have certain deposits of of of, of minerals and we are mm. talking about for example in trokana there are huge reservoirs of oil mm. uh, in 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 nyanza mm -hmm. there are proven deposits of gold mm. uh, in 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 Kuala county there are proven deposits of rare earth minerals mm. in 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 kitui county there are deposits of coal mm. how comes we have not seen a, a concerted effort towards tapping these resources, save for Kuala uh, 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 Sands, where you have uh, the titanium, uh, which has now become the biggest uh, mm. uh, mining company in Kenya. Well, Brian, the, the funny thing about uh, mining especially is that uh, it goes in stages. Uh, one is that you can you can know that potentially there is gold in 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 Kakamega. There's potentially gold in Siaya, but then bef before you move from the point of knowing that there are potential gold deposits in these areas to the point of actual mining, it it requires a lot of scientific uh, uh, analysis that is done through what we call exploration or prospecting. Now this is the case also when it comes to oil and gas. Like the country we have always known, there are certain zones that are fully mineralized for having all potential. We have that in uh, in Turkana that has already been identified. We have that in Marsabit. We have that even Kajiado uh, and Lamu. And these are places where we all know that there there is oil and gas deposits that can be of potential benefit for the country. However, before uh, any investment in oil and gas and or mining is done, there is a lot of time and effort taken to actually carry out this scientific analysis. And for us, it has taken some time uh, because of the up and down of the of the uh, of the extractive cycles especially for for, for the, around the globe uh, the changing price of commodities has always be, had a significant impact on, on uh, how quickly you can be able to move like for example uh, when oil was doing well at uh, over a hundred dollars a barrel uh, uh, there was excitement because now oil oil players had a lot more money that they can uh, choose to 
invest in uh, exploration of prospecting programs as opposed to saving that money because the, it was a boom. Now when the prices go lower, you'll find more of these companies spending a lot more time developing the current assets that they have instead of investing them on new uh, potential projects like us would happen uh, usually. Now to give you just an idea of how long sometimes it takes before a program comes into fruition, it took about 20 years before uh, from the point where we realized we have good deposits of heavy mineral sands in uh, Kwale to the point of actually being able to mine and actually extract and even ship our first shipment. It was almost 20 years in the making. Mm -hmm. So in as much as we might have uh, some good announcements that have been made over time with regard to to uh, good deposits in the country, whether it is oil, whether it is uh, the gold that we found in Siaya uh, uh, and in Kakamega, uh, the, the time that it takes before uh, somebody can come and make what we call a final investment decision of setting up and mine and actual extraction is what takes some time. Uh, and, and this is the cycles of, of this business the world over. It is not unique to Kenya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is true that... Um, yeah, uh, you know, from prospects, you know, mm. to setting up mm. the infrastructure mm. that is needed, uh, of course, sourcing for markets, you know, mm. em employees and all things, you know, it can take time. Mm. But uh, I, I remember there was a time even uh, a base titanium was complaining mm -hmm. because of, um, you know, slow bureaucracy within the government in, yeah. in, in the approval process. Mm. There was also uh, the politics around uh, the communities and the mm. area mm. and, uh, you know, of course, vested interest. Mm. And, and they were saying this was ha somehow frustrating the efforts in investing mm. in quality and of course it was also making the investment pretty much mm. more expensive than um, they are used to mm. and, and so how, how, how do we ensure that uh, you know we cut down on our politics we mm. cut down on, 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 on time that it takes, you know, uh, when it comes to approval processes and so much, mm. uh, in a bit not to frustrate investors and, of course, to entice more investors mm. into the country. Well, O'Brien, it, it is the reality of life that uh, uh, minerals live underground and uh, we humans live on the ground. Uh, <laughs> and before uh, an investor can be able to come from wherever country they're coming in to be able to actually get what's underground, mm -hmm. they'd have to deal with the, the people they found on the surface. Uh, and so this is one of the realistic di dynamics of, uh, of mining all across the world. Uh, uh, of course, every nation has different uh, aspects around it. There are nations whereby, maybe because of military rule and authoritarianism, you are able to move people within a record time of two years and clear out an area to, 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 to be able to carry out mining. But in the case of Kenya, where we have a dynamic society, uh, where uh, uh, ideally you are meant to negotiate with people and discuss with them and, and discuss benefits. Our laws are such that, that uh, they require the participation uh, of, of the community because you might get a, a, a mining license from the government mm -hmm. but if you do not have the community license to operate then you will always have problems going forward. And uh, one of the other dynamic things that have always happened especially in the like Kenya is that uh, some of these minerals are usually found in uh, uh, historically uh, economically managed marginalized regions. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find that uh, whenever an announcement of a potential uh, mineral deposit being found, the level of excitement and the level of interest that is drawn from the community is that we are potentially going to be uh, saved from the kind of uh, 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 dark period that we have been mm. over the years. And so it becomes the saving grace. And with it comes a lot of other dynamics. People believe that they can be overnight millionaires in a day mm. without understanding that at times... Uh, even as much as it might be said that there are million ounces of gold or three million ounces of gold being found or or how many uh, barrels of oil being found in an area, uh, the time it takes before at that point of having made that discovery and actually getting it out of the ground require it, it, it's long and during that period there'll have to be a lot of horse trading and negotiation between the communities. For me what I'm very excited about is that uh, for the country uh, we've made two laws that are very uh, 
uh, a community focused and this is the petroleum act uh, uh, of 2019 and the mining act of 2016 whereby communities have really been given a place whereby they can know that the moment a, a activity begins they become at the center that they they share in the benefits that come out of the of, of the mining process uh, and they are also uh, cons uh, consulted uh, for any uh, community based or uh, csr that the company might have mm. so that they are the heart of making the decisions that are impact on them uh, also some of these numbers have also been saying that uh, we, uh, uh, we we are looking at uh, empowering also the devolved units so that they have a share or a stake in in in, in the mining activity and the revenues so that this this these revenues actually have a widespread impact at county level to every single person who uh, uh, is is affected by the mining activity so for me uh, our laws have become robust enough uh, the question that is there is uh, for, uh, for 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 the government right now to to try as much as possible to engage with communities to the level of uh, al not allowing them or being being allowed by politicians to politicize the process so it doesn't become uh, an issue for a, a general election you know that uh, if if I, if I can chocosa these Kenyans a bit uh, they might see that I'm more sympathetic to them as, as opposed to my opponent mm -hmm. uh, and thereby by doing that you end up slowing down uh, uh, investment decisions that would have naturally helped everyone if everybody was singing the same voice mm -hmm. so uh, the only way to remedy this like I've said is that uh, we've tried to make sure that uh, it does not become political that one singular person speaks about an, uh, an issue of uh, extractives that involves the community the laws insist that you're supposed to bring in as many people as possible representing varied interest they sit down they set up a committee that actually looks at how these revenues will be distributed within uh, the, the the entire county and even how they engage with the potential investor uh, but for me I, I believe if we are able to keep politics at the minimum if the economic environment is such that that allows investors to come in freely without uh, having fear about whether the licenses that have been given are able to withstand the test of time mm -hmm. I think we might be able to see a mining take off uh, quite easily I think the only other challenge that you raised uh, on the issue of base titanium and also renewals of licenses there was a period whereby uh, truth be told licensing became a very big issue it is a big issue even as we speak right now uh, the ease of uh, acquisition of licenses is still a bit more uh, problematic uh, uh, but uh, the ministry has been uh, very forthcoming in stating that uh, it will put every effort to try and uh, make sure licensing resumes because uh, towards the end of 20 uh, the government uh, put a moratorium on issuance of uh, new licenses in the country and I think that has greatly impacted the ability of people to get renewals uh, uh, but uh, going forward I foresee with the release of this uh, airborne data survey yeah. uh, we might be able to see licensing resume within the country uh, the other dynamics of course of uh, having uh, license holders who are absentees or who are holding up area that could potentially be uh, uh, good for the country uh, while not developing the assets that's something that also needs to be addressed because we've had a lot of cowboy investors who are holding licenses but not uh, developing them and and this this ends up uh, making the country not benefit uh, from from this and it's been an issue when it comes to the oil and gas licensing regime as well as the mining licensing regime uh, yeah. I, I remember and i want to take you back to the year around um uh, 2012, 2013, 2014 there, mm. there was a lot of excitement that um, after, you know, huge deposits of um, rare earth minerals were discovered mm. around uh, Shimba Hills. Yes. And um, Chinese investors, you know, were lining up mm. to try and exploit those resources. And rare earth minerals have become, have become um, you know, the hottest uh, 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 minerals in the world because of uh, their, 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 their value mm. in, 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 in in the construction of various things you know, mm. from uh, computer chips uh, 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 to missiles mm. and so much uh, then all of a sudden 
there was a lot of quietness. What mm. happened? Well, O'Brien, what happened is that uh, during the 2012 uh, uh, period, uh, uh, the, there was uh, an investor from Australia who had acquired a, a, a license, but uh, on analysis uh, post 2013 uh, of how the license was acquired, they were found that there were some issues which were uh, not quite rightly done. Uh, uh, and at the heart of it, uh, since now it's already matters that have been arbitrated on, uh, those lack of appropriate licensing from uh, uh, the various entities that are meant to license. Brima Hill area is a sanctuary that uh, is a forest sanctuary, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of approvals that were required both from the Forest Service, NEMA, and things like that. But uh, at the time, the license was issued without uh, getting the necessary approvals, and uh, at the time, uh, Balala went ahead to just make a, a new statement that uh, that license would be revoked it then went on to a court process which then got escalated to international arbitration uh, luckily for us because uh, I was with the ministry at the time uh, some advisors to the cabinet secretary were able to to put up a good case on behalf of Kenya uh, and uh, we won the international arbitration uh, and uh, with that uh, then the area became available for Kenya now to be able to present to the world uh, this is what has just recently been uh, advanced I beg, because there was an appeal to the arbitration award that was done for Kenya um, but looking forward um, I believe uh, rare arts deposits still potent to have the biggest potential to, to, to bring great revenue to the country. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the level of activity on rare earth uh, minerals has really dwindled. There's some activity in uh, Mozambique and uh, countries and, and, uh, and uh, Burundi and uh, Tanzania. Uh, but it, it, uh, the interest that ca is coming to Kenya has been quite low at the moment because everybody needed to know that we have finished up with all the cases that involved that Mrima Hills uh, sanctuary. Uh, we also have additional deposits of rare earth in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Homa Bay and also in Kericho. And all these uh, investors are looking towards and are assessing. Uh, the potential that this will have for the country is quite, quite big because uh, 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 I think there is no item that we use right now that does not contain an element of uh, rare earth elements. Uh, we have uh, one of the largest deposits of Niobe in, in the whole uh, con in the whole world actually it's one of the third largest uh, reserves for rare arts mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for outside of China so I think that is uh, something that we could potentially look into but of course it will require uh, a lot of goodwill from government investors sometimes get very wary uh, of an investment destination if they find that there are some things that are making people not be able to thrive as much and like I said one of the issues was of course licensing uh, but now that uh, we are moving towards streamlining the licensing regime then we potentially might be able to get the attention of um, uh, mining investors who can now then look at uh, uh, the, the Mrima Hill project and, and redevelop it. Uh, what I do know uh, President Ruzo has been very passionate about is that uh, for such a great asset uh, the, the country or the state has to be at the heart of it mm -hmm. so that it just doesn't become something that uh, profiteers make money out of and Kenyan, yeah, Kenyans end up losing in the end so I, I know there, there, there is a very elaborate plan to make sure that uh, in the moment that we try and monetize on this particular uh, asset such as Amrima uh, can uh, the, the, the state will be at the heart of those negotiations so that we have a productive revenue share with the potential investors or the people uh, people who will be coming to mine that particular asset mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh, well, let's hope uh, that, that the issues around these um, will be resolved so that uh, uh, the country can start tapping into these resources. And uh, also on the issue of oil, um, I know global prices have uh, somehow plunged. Uh, but uh, is there any hope for, 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 for oil going forward? I, I, I'm very optimistic about oil. Um, uh, I know that we had a we had a situation whereby globally uh, there was a slowdown on investments and, and some of these new projects like which are coming from uh, uh, Africa. Uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, this this uh, is, is slowly changing over time. And during that period when we were considering uh, 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 waiting for the investor, this is Talo and uh, the other investment partners to make a decision on whether they can be able to proceed 
proceed with investing in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, the country and the ministry has been working very hard to try and de-risk uh, some of the issues that uh, investors ha and the concerns that they had uh, in terms of the pipeline, ensuring that uh, land access is available, that there's access to water and things like that. And, and, and we've done quite a good job on that. Uh, I know towards the end of this year, uh, Tala will be making a final investment decision on how to proceed on this particular thing after carrying out a successful uh, early oil program, EOPS, uh, that was done uh, towards the end of last year. So uh, uh, for me, I'm, I'm very bullish and uh, optimistic about uh, us being able to, to take, uh, to, 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 to actually uh, uh, exploit this particular resource. Uh, but uh, ideally, again, I still believe we need to, as a country, uh, show that uh, we have a bigger plan because we are competing with uh, another country like Uganda which has found an exit route for its oil. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the viability of some of the investments we are making at the north came into question. Uh, but uh, there are already plans to look at having a refinery in Lamu which could be something that could probably change the game for, for, for the country. Uh, there, there, there have been also interest by a number of investors to try and set up uh, refinery points across the country so that uh, uh, the moment we extract this oil, we will not just be uh, just a net ex exporter, but also we can find a way we can work with our East African partners to make sure that uh, some of this oil works for us. It's a, it's a long shot, uh, uh, as some people say, but uh, it's better when we are thinking that broadly and that large. Uh, and for me, I still believe that uh, uh, we, we will have uh, this uh, Turkana oil become something that we can be able to utilize for the future. Mm -hmm. There's still some ongoing activity and interest from investors uh, on the offshore uh, basis. Uh, and also there's a lot of onshore activity around Mandera area and uh, things like that. So I, I still see that we, we, we will be able to take, uh, to become a serious oil producer going forward. Mm -hmm. The only challenge, of course, uh, when you look at the way the world is going, is that uh, a lot of uh, international money is moving away from uh, 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 carbon-based uh, uh, investments and that is things like oil and coal and, and things like that towards more renewable energy using more of electricity uh, we are even uh, just recently being told that we were about to get a 10 billion fund just for geothermal development I mean the, much of the international uh, uh, finance uh, organizations are moving away from oil uh, so as other investors but uh, I still believe uh, they're about it's about one two more decades kids uh, we have with the uh, oil being still at the center of, of our development agenda especially for Africa so there, there might be some still good viability whether the pricing will support uh, such investment is where the question comes about because again uh, we need to have certain uh, global prices to make some of the investments look viable mm -hmm. the moment we keep dropping below $50 barrel of oil yeah. uh, some of these investment decisions look very tight and it's hard to foresee. And, yeah. and, and, and uh, when you look at uh, you know, global fuel prices uh, in the last three years, you have seen uh, you know, prices have uh, dropped by more than 40%, uh, 45%. Mm. And uh, Kenya was hoping that, um, it was hoping to ride on the oil boom mm. of, um, of uh, 2014, 20, mm. you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, mm. in order to attract more investors in it, mm. nascent oil industry. But this has not ha happened. Mm. And this is casting uh, a, a serious doubt on the future of uh, oil billions going forward. Mm. Do you think we still have a case? Uh, we might still have a case. I mean, uh, the commodity cycle boom and the way it has been going up and down, uh, there might be a case for it. Uh, there are projections uh, which still uh, show that uh, there will still be demand for oil going forward. Uh, China is still a big consumer of, of, of oil and a big buyer of, of oil across the globe. Uh, so uh, I do not foresee us having a problem with that. The problem is whether we can maintain price points that actually make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we've argued uh, as a country that anything above $50 uh, per, per barrel will still make a business case for Kenya. Uh, but at times, uh, uh, these prices have been seen to dip quite low, uh, and it, it has a significant impact on a lot of these activities. Mm -hmm. The other issue is that uh, we also would have to look for uh, creative ways of even financing and keeping uh, it, it quite affordable for anyone who 
who's coming in uh, mm -hmm. to make an investment uh, in the long term. Uh, the bigger problem comes in when uh, we, and uh, of course this is how the oil contracting has been done, that you begin to have revenues as, as the moment the first oil starts to trickle out. Uh, but uh, there are mechanisms in which a country can uh, agree with the investors to try and see how do we keep it uh, viable over the long term and then we figure out how uh, some of the benefits that come out of that can be kept in a long term uh, f framework such as sovereign wealth funds and things like that so that we do not seem to be very eager to to dip into into the, the into the jar much earlier than we, if we could let some time pass by of course these dynamics are very difficult to argue to to Mwanaichi mm -hmm. uh, who is saying that uh, oil would be flowing uh, but uh, these are the dynamics that can be put in place. I, I, I'm still a believer that uh, we will still have some high oil prices, yep. uh, uh, but uh, I do not think I can project beyond the next decade that we can maintain such pricing. Uh, there's a lot of competition from uh, uh, shale uh, oil, uh, uh, which is coming from uh, uh, the US, uh, which is now producing, has become a significant producer of oil at quite uh, a lower price than the traditional uh, oil mining like we have seen here in Kenya. Yep. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the, and also the advancement in technology might also make some of the utilization of some of these fuels redundant with time. But uh, uh, the only thing is just to be optimistic. Uh, uh, I, I still see that uh, we can have a decade or two of good oil production for the country before we see what the global dynamics will do. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as we wind up um, uh, quickly, uh, uh, let's also discuss uh, the issues around uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, the impact they're having on uh, the mining industry of course and uh, uh, the slow demand uh, for for minerals you know has somehow led to uh, downsizing and of course right sizing mm. uh, have we felt this impact here in Kenya indeed the impact has been quite significant in the country uh, I, I, I in fact one case in point is what is happening in uh, Tata Chemicals Magadi where mm -hmm. where they, 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 they are opting to really uh, significantly downsize its workforce uh, because uh, commodities are not what they used to be before uh, soda ash, for example, which is being produced by Tata Chemicals Magadi, uh, is, 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 uh, is now facing stiff competition from, uh, from, from synthetic producers. And, and, you know, the advancement in technology sometimes renders some of these natural occurring uh, commodities to, to face stiff competition. Mm -hmm. Kenya flows per had to shut down operations because it could not compete with the cheaper options that were out there for flows per. Uh, uh, and, 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 and there are lot of other dynamics that are coming into play because uh, sometimes also to keep some mining operations going uh, when there is not much activity so you have, there's a big impact which is affecting uh, for example the small scale mines uh, for for gemstones within type Saveta region uh, also within Migori because some of these buyers uh, one were limited in the amount of travel that they could do two even uh, the pricing was not as, as good as possible because people uh, global investors out there are saving more uh, rather than spending on things that uh, would actually be uh, luxury brands and things like that so there has been a significant impact um, there are other commodities which are doing quite well. Uh, iron ore is doing quite well in globally because of demand from China. Mm. So in some segments uh, there is there is uh, a boom, and in some segments there is a complete uh, uh, drop in terms of pricing, and it has affected uh, people negatively. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think uh, for going forward, I think uh, it's important that uh, mining investors, mining business owners, can be able to foresee some of these situations and plan for them and create mechanisms of actually being able to put people back in work. Uh, for me, I w uh, I've seen some of the uh, ex uh, 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 mechanisms that were put in place to enable uh, mining investors save a lot of money in terms of taxation uh, have been clawed back in the latest uh, budget 
that was presented in Parliament. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is not the moment whereby we, we, we should be doing things like this. We should be now making it much easier for people to get equipment in, to be able to, so that we, we create uh, a revitalization of the sector, uh, considering how much of a dull moment uh, that COVID has taken us. So these are the things that I propose that uh, the government considers doing and we look at some of these productive because mining is a productive sector yeah. and the more we invest in it the more we allow money to easily flow to such a sector the more jobs we see being created the more value the more foreign exchange uh, and I, I think one of the biggest foreign exchange earners for the country right now is the Kuala Mineral Sands project so if we can see uh, uh, ourselves really promoting some of these businesses and allowing them to thrive mm. and, and opening up new opportunities because there are opportunities uh, all across the country yeah. uh, these are the things that we might see happen for the goodwill of the country. Very good. Yeah. Stephen, in the interest of time, uh, we have to come to the end of this thank discussion. You. Thank, thank you, you for so having very me. Much yeah. For your insight. Yeah, thank you very much, O'Brien. I appreciate forward it. forward to having you again in the future. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, thank you. We've been discussing the extractive industry and what we need to do to boost uh, our revenues from this critical sector. You have heard it all from the experts. And of course, earlier on, we were discussing how to expand and of course accelerate uh, infrastructural development here in Kenya and how to tap into the opportunities that come by. Well, my name is O'Brien Kemani. It can't get better than this. Remember, Kurunzi Mashinani is coming up next uh, for me and the rest of the business team. Have a good morning. Well, actually, it's good afternoon.